Previously, we discussed the teacher Jane Elliott's experiment to teach her students about discrimination. She divided her class by eye color and gave one set of students advantages over the other. Students then switched roles the next day, so each student experienced being a member of the advantaged and disadvantaged groups. We reviewed this experiment in our discussion on a true experiment. But Elliot's experiment might better be classified as a quasi-experiment, one that meets some but not all of the requirements of a true experiment. Because of how she structured the experiment, her results didn't carry the full weight of a rigorous scientific finding. But that doesn't mean that her experiment was worthless or that her findings are without merit. Within the exercises, she made a startling finding that student performance on reading, math, and spelling notably declined for students in the disadvantaged group, compared to how students performed when they were part of the advantaged group. Her experiment also showed that the activities she asked her students to undertake left them with a lasting understanding of discrimination. Decades later, her students returned to discuss with her the impact that the exercise had on their lives. Another finding that came out of Elliott's study was that feelings of discrimination can have an impact on test performance. These findings are important and worth taking seriously, but should be interpreted with some caution. True experiments are the hallmark of scientific research, but quite often we simply can't do a true experiment. Consider our criteria for a true experiment. Control, manipulation, random selection, and random assignment. First. Control may not be possible or desirable. We might be in the early stages of a research project and testing out a particular treatment. In such cases, putting half our subjects into a control group might not be a good use of resources. Second, you as the researcher may not be able to manipulate the variables you need. They may occur naturally in a population you wish to study. Third, limited access to subjects or high costs might prevent true random selection. In fact, very few experiments end up using random selection of subjects. One reason might be because the nature of the study demands non-random participants, such as in a medical study where you may only want participants currently suffering from a particular ailment. Another is pure practicality. Recruitment is difficult and you work with whoever you can get. Finally, random assignment can be difficult. There are times when your subjects of interest sort themselves into groups and not always by random. You might be interested in studying economic policies, for example. You can't randomly assign some countries and not others to practice austerity. In these situations, researchers often turn to quasi and semi-experimental designs. And if you find yourself needing to do that, don't despair. As Jane Elliott's work demonstrates, such Alternate kinds of research can have tremendous value in answering our questions, solving our problems, and increasing our knowledge of the world. Let's discuss a different experiment so we can get a better understanding of some of the differences between a true and quasi-experiment. In 1973, John Darley and C. Daniel Batson published a study in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology called, quote, from Jerusalem to Jericho, a study of situational and dispositional variables in helping behavior, end quote. As a side note, I promise you that obscure titles are not required to publish your work when it's finished. You really can be as straightforward and clear as you like. Darley and Batson wanted to test the logic of the Good Samaritan parable from the Bible. In the parable, Jesus tells the story of a robbery victim and the three men who pass him while he is lying half dead in the road. The first two, a priest and a Levite, both religious figures, pass by without stopping. But the third, a Samaritan, who is not a religious figure, stops and cares for the man, even providing payment for further treatment. Darley and Batson wanted to test the qualities that induce someone to stop and help someone in need. That is, they wanted to ask, what kind of person becomes a good Samaritan? They identified three key variables that they thought might influence whether someone stops to provide aid. The first is task focus. They wanted to test the impact of a person's thoughts and focus when they encounter the victim. Is that person thinking about religious and ethical matters? This is separate from being a religious person and instead is about what's on your mind at the time of encountering the person in need. 
They want to know if someone who is thinking about religious and ethical matters is more likely to stop and offer assistance than someone who's thinking of other things. Second, Darley and Batson hypothesize that time matters, specifically whether or not the would-be helper is in a hurry. The priest and Levite may have had others waiting for them, leaving them no time to help the victim. In a generous interpretation of the parable, they may have felt torn between disappointing those waiting for them by being late and helping the person in need. The final variable is religiosity. They wanted to know if having a specific outlook on religion matters in terms of providing aid to a victim. Specifically, Darley and Batson distinguish between three kinds of religiously focused persons. Those who are religious for their own intrinsic reasons, those who seek to gain by being or acting religious, and those whose religious practice focuses on a quest for meaning in their lives. They identify the quest reasoning and the intrinsic reasoning as Samaritan-like traits, and hypothesize that such persons would be more likely to stop to aid a victim. This overview gives us a clear, dependent variable, behavior toward a victim, and three independent variables task focus at the time of encountering a victim, whether or not the person is in a hurry, and religiosity. Darley and Batson set up a very interesting experiment to test their three hypotheses. They recruited seminary students at Princeton Theological Seminary and gave them questionnaires to measure their religiosity. On another day, the subjects returned for the experiment. They were told that they were participating in a study on careers for seminar students and that they'd be asked to give a short recorded talk on a topic. Based on random assignment to a particular group, they were then told the topic of their talk. Half the group received the parable of the Good Samaritan, and the other half were asked to prepare a talk on the kinds of jobs that seminar students would enjoy and be well prepared for. No group was told that the experiment was designed to test the Good Samaritan parable itself. The participants were further randomly assigned an additional condition. Each person was told to head to a nearby building where another researcher would record their talk. But the urgency of their move to the next building varied. Some were told they had plenty of time, others that they should head right over, and still others that they were already late and should hurry up. On their way to the nearby building, each subject passed an alley. In that alley, there was a person, slumped over, coughing and groaning. This person was, unknowingly to the participants, part of the research team and was evaluating their behavior. They used a zero to five point scale to assess the reaction of the subject. A zero meant the subject didn't notice the victim at all. Those given ones noticed, but didn't offer any aid. Twos didn't stop to help, but they reported the person's condition to the research assistant when they arrived at the next building. A three meant the subject stopped and spoke to the victim, perhaps inquiring if they were okay. Fours insisted on helping the victim inside a nearby building. Finally, the highest score, five, was given to those subjects that stopped and either helped the victim inside a building and refused to leave until assistance arrived, or insisted on taking the victim somewhere else for aid. After this encounter, the participants continued to the building where they gave their recorded talk and took another questionnaire on ethics, just as if the person in the alley was an accidental encounter and had nothing to do with the experiment at all. They then headed to a debriefing session with the facilitators where they learned of the deception in the study and its true purpose. Let me pause for a moment and point out that Testing parables and sayings is a great way to hone your research method skills. I once had a professor who asked us to pick a proverb and figure out how we would test it. How might you test an apple a day keeps the doctor away? Or good fences make good neighbors? Or absence makes the heart grow fonder? Do good things come in small packages? Is the grass always greener on the other side? All of these are things you could actually test, just like the Good Samaritan parable. Let's return to our experiment. Darley and Batson found that neither religiosity nor the type of talk the subjects were to give mattered in terms of which people stopped to help the victim. What did matter was whether or not they were in a hurry. Those in a hurry were less likely to provide aid than those who were told they had plenty of time. 
they did find that among those who helped, those who saw religion as a kind of quest for meaning offered less aid than those who had other religiosity views. Interesting, right? The Good Samaritan study is a strong example of an experiment, if one that is not perfectly a true experiment. Did you spot the way in which this study falls just short of our true experiment criteria? Let's return to our criteria to evaluate it. The criteria, as we just discussed, are control, manipulation, random assignment, and random selection. Let's start with control. Were Darley and Batson able to establish control groups so they could genuinely test for the role of the independent variables in participant behavior? Yes, they did. They tested two independent variables in the experiment itself, what topic was on the mind of participants as they prepared for their talk, and whether or not they were in a hurry. Without a control group, we would have had everyone in the study told they were in a hurry and given the Good Samaritan parable. The students in the group told to prepare a talk on post-seminary careers were the control group. Their conditions were in almost every way similar to those given the Good Samaritan parable. They met with a researcher, took a questionnaire, were told to prepare a talk, encountered the victim, gave a talk, took the ethics questionnaire, then headed to the debriefing. Like the treatment group, they also were divided into the three hurry conditions, allowing researchers to also test whether or not that variable mattered. The difference was they weren't asked to prepare a talk about the Good Samaritan parable. In essence, we actually had six groups, three for the Good Samaritan parable and three for the post-seminar career topic. Now, as with any social scientific work, Darley and Batson didn't have complete control over their subjects. If you pour one chemical into another, it will obey you every time. Human subjects, as we've seen, don't always do what we want them to. We don't know for sure, for example, that subjects told to prepare a talk on the Good Samaritan parable were actually thinking about that when they passed the victim in the alley. And Darley and Batson reported that four of their subjects became suspicious of the experiment at some point, requiring that the researchers remove their data from the study. This is the kind of complication that we don't always find in the natural and physical sciences. Nitric acid never suspects it's in an experiment and refuses to participate. Let's think about the Elliott eye color study again for a second. Did it have a control group? Not really. She divided students into two groups, but neither was a true control group. One group received advantages and another disadvantages. A true control might have been to have a third group of, say, hazel-eyed persons who received neither advantages nor disadvantages on both days. So Darlene Batson did okay on control. What about our second criterion, manipulation? Manipulation, you may recall, means that the researcher controls the administration of the independent variable. You're able to assign conditions to your participants rather than having to work with conditions that have occurred naturally. If I'm studying the impact of government type on whether or not a country goes to war, I can't assign each country with a type of government. I have to work with evaluating how they already are. This is one reason, by the way, why political scientists don't tend to use a lot of experiments, particularly when studying international relations. Are Darley and Batson able to manipulate their variables? Well, two of them, yes. The level of hurry, for example, was assigned by the researchers. So was the type of talk, the subjects game, which was aiming at putting particular thoughts in the minds of participants when they pass the victim. But the third variable, religiosity, was not directly manipulated by the researchers. That pre-existed the study, and so the researchers measured it in the initial questionnaire prior to the experiment portion of the study, but didn't manipulate it. So Darley and Batson were two out of three on manipulation. This does keep the study from being a really true experiment. How about Elliot? She did manipulate her variables. She decided which students experienced discriminatory treatment using eye color as her guide. Our third criterion is random assignment. This means that subjects can't self-select into groups, but are instead randomly assigned by the researcher into a treatment or control group. How did Darley and Batson do? Just fine. I mentioned that they used random assignment. They did note that they made an error in their assignment and over-assigned to the intermediate hurry group. But they still used a random process to assign people to groups, which helps preserve the internal validity of the study. How about Elliot? We already discussed that she assigned groups by eye color, which isn't a random process, so no random assignment for her. 
Our final criterion is random selection. This is what helps ensure the external validity of our study, that is, whether or not we can generalize our results from our participants to a wider audience. We already discussed how Elliot didn't randomly select her participants, but instead used her own third grade students. You've probably figured out by now that this is one place where Darley and Batson fall short, according to my synopsis. They make no mention of their selection process. They just say that they recruited 67 students, 47 of whom participated in the experiment. It's unclear if the total student population of the seminary is 67 students, or if the 67 were selected at random from amongst the students there. We also aren't told why the researchers chose to focus on the seminary, nor do they discuss how using a seminary population might limit the generalizability of their results. It is possible that Darley and Batson did use random selection from the students at the seminary and just didn't report it in their article. If so, then their article would mostly meet all four criteria. If not, well, it's hard to blame them. Often with experiments, we end up recruiting those who are willing from those close to hand. Many academics use their university students for their studies precisely because they're convenient and usually cheaply acquired, sometimes just for extra credit. So we shouldn't really fault an experiment too much for using a convenient population. We just have to limit our expectations of the external validity of the study and possibly replicate their work. This analysis showed that Elliot's discrimination experiment meets fewer of the criteria for a true experiment than Darley and Batson's Good Samaritan experiment. That doesn't mean Elliot's contribution lacks value, not at all. True experiments are valued because they maximize the internal and external validity of the study, but plenty of studies that are unable to attain that high bar still help answer questions and improve our knowledge. Your goal is to aim for the four criteria of a true experiment when possible. When it isn't possible, you do the best you can to still achieve the goals of internal and external validity and acknowledge where you fell short. Think of this as more of a continuum than a dichotomy. You're aiming for the ideal, but falling short of that is definitely not a deal breaker. The goal is to be open and transparent about your methods so that other researchers can judge for themselves the scope and value of your work. Darley and Batson, for example, were open about the fact that only 47 students ended up finishing their experiment, and of those, seven cases had to be thrown out. 40 subjects is a pretty small sample and limits what statistical analysis can tell us. And yet this study has been cited more than 1,700 times since 1973. Transparency about the small sample size helps other researchers evaluate the impact of the work. Hiding issues or exaggerating claims is more likely to get your work ignored than honesty about challenges, how you address them, and what they mean for your results and claims. So how much can you claim? True experiments let us claim causality because the researcher controls and manipulates the independent variables. When combined with random selection and assignment, this lets us be pretty sure about the role of our independent variable in leading to change in our dependent variable. We can establish cause and effect. In a quasi-experiment, some of these things remain the same. You still have subjects, groups, treatments, and measures of a dependent variable, what you don't typically have is random assignment to groups or complete control over all other possible variables. Differences that arise between your groups, therefore, may be due to factors other than your chosen independent variables. That means that even if we find differences between our treatment and control groups, we can't be confident that they're caused by our independent variable. There are other differences. Quasi-experiments may occur outside of a controlled laboratory environment. This is one reason why the researcher can't control for other variables. And typically, people are already assigned to groups outside of the control of the researcher. So for example, you might want to compare children with different birth orders. You can't randomly assign a subject to suddenly be the firstborn child. Or you might want to see the effects of long-term pet ownership on people's happiness. I suppose you could bring puppies to random participants and wait a few years, but you're probably better off just working with existing pet owners. 
Another option might be that you want to compare high performers to low performers on some kind of skill. You might have participants take an aptitude test and then assign them into groups based on their scores. That kind of matched group setup isn't random, but it might fit your study. Let's dig into the broad category of quasi-experimental design so you can see the wealth of viable options you have available to you. Just keep in mind, aim for as many of the elements of a true experiment as possible so you maximize the validity of your work. But if you want to work on a project where some of those criteria just can't be met, you still have a number of quality options available to you. First, we have the single group pretest post test design. There's no control group at all in this design. You measure the dependent variable, introduce the treatment, and then measure it again. Now, if you've been paying attention, you know that this goes against a key idea of an experiment. There's no control group. Experiments are all about control. But there are reasons to sacrifice control. Single group pretest post test designs are often used as pre experiments or pilot studies. It's a way of testing out your ideas on the cheap before committing to a full fledged experiment. Let's think this through. When we're using treatment and control groups, we're really looking for two effects. First, we want to see that the treatment matters for the treatment group. That is, the dependent variable changes after the introduction of the independent variable. Second, we want to see if the control group shows no change. If the control group changes too, then we can't really say that our independent variable is what caused the change, right? That's why control is usually so important. But if the treatment group shows no change, you don't need the control group. That alone tells you that your treatment doesn't matter. One of the key roles of the control group is to help us eliminate other variables, not just establish the viability of the independent variable. That's why running a pre-experiment pilot can be so valuable. It tests to see if the treatment matters. If it doesn't, you end the study without committing to the greater expense of adding a control group. Remember, that's a lot of participants to recruit, each of whom might need to be paid for their participation. If you do find results in the pilot, that can justify the further expense to grant agencies to do a more thorough study. So let's say you have an idea for a new training program in your company, perhaps on methods to increase work productivity. You've discovered a new task management system that works really well for you, and you're curious if it would help others in the office as well. You know from our previous discussions that your personal experience alone may not be representative, so you want to do a pilot study before suggesting widespread adoption of this new software. Now, you could build a true experiment to achieve this. You could get a random sample of employees and randomly assign them to one of two groups. One group receives the, the treatment, which is training in how to use this new task management software and committing to use it for, say, two weeks. The other group gets no training. Both groups take questionnaires at the start and end of the experiment to self-assess their productivity. But is all of this really necessary at this point? You just want to know if your new task management system that you like so much might help out others in your office. To use another proverb that we might want to test someday, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Why not go with a one group pre-test post-test design? Recruit some coworkers, have them fill out the questionnaire self-assessing their current productivity, train them in the use of the software, and then test again after the two week period is up. If you see strong results, you could then do a second run with a control group to check for the influence of other variables. It might be, for example, that simply being asked to focus on productivity makes people more productive, or that a Hawthorne reactivity effect is occurring. But it's also pretty common for a pilot study like this to forego the full study with the control group and just to use the results to assess whether or not employees should be trained in the use of this software. Just be honest about the limits of the pre-experiment and the results may differ when other groups undergo the training. Another type of quasi-experiment mimics the true experiment in all but one way. It's called the non-equivalent groups design. 
You have two groups, one treatment and one control. You measure the dependent variable for both groups. You introduce an intervention to the treatment group and then measure again for the two groups. The only difference, and it is a big important difference, is that the assignment to the control and treatment groups is not random. Instead, you end up using pre-existing groups that are similar, such as two organizations or communities of the same size or that consist of the same people. Let's say that you want to study the impact of participating in a simulation on student learning. You're interested in whether participating in the simulation is enough by itself, if it needs to be combined with a lecture for maximum impact, or if lecture alone is best. So you give your three sections a quiz on the material, then lecture to two sections of a class, but not the third. One of the lecture-only sections does not participate in the simulation, but the other two do. All three sections then take a second quiz on the material. This is definitely quasi-experimental. It's taking place in a real-world setting, a classroom. Assignment to each group isn't random, and there may be systematic differences between the two groups. There are also some concerns about internal validity, testing effects, history effects, and Hawthorne effects, for example, that might interfere with your results. And yet, none of this would negate the potential impact of such a study. The key is to recognize these potential limitations, try to minimize them where possible, and ultimately report them when you write up your results. Again, what these designs have in common is that they fall short of the ideal criteria of a true experiment. That means we're not able to draw as many conclusions from quasi-experimental approaches because they lack the highest levels of internal and external validity. Quasi-experiments are much more susceptible to the threats to validity that we discussed in our last lecture. Consider history effects, for example. Since the researcher is usually not controlling the conditions in a laboratory and sometimes is just observing the impact of variables they did not themselves introduce, outside events can have a potentially large impact on the study's results. Laboratory experiments are more controlled and tend to be shorter, and therefore may not be as susceptible to this. For the same reason, maturation effects can also be an issue in semi-experimental studies. There are many other kinds of experimental designs that we haven't considered. Repeated measures designs, for example, are experiments where you take measures of the dependent variable at multiple times across the experiment, looking at the impact of the independent variable over time. For example, if you're studying weight loss, you would take multiple measures of weight, say once a week, while in the intervening periods you're introducing your independent variable, perhaps dietary restrictions or an exercise program. This allows you to look at effects over time. In our example of task management training programs, you might want to measure the dependent variable a few times, perhaps immediately after training, again two weeks later, and yet again six months later. That's a repeated measure design, and it would give you a sense of any long-term changes that the productivity training might have. Interrupted time series designs are a version of this, where you typically measure the dependent variable at least three times before treatment and three times after treatment. This can help reduce the role of maturation effects on your study because you're documenting changes in your subjects both before and after the treatment. There are also single-subject experiments. In these, you start off with a control or baseline condition in a single case, then introduce a treatment, then return to the control condition. This lets, this lets you test to see if the treatment matters. This kind of design is something you might use in your daily life. You might, for example, go from not drinking coffee to drinking a cup a day to not drinking it again to see the impact the caffeine has on your system. There are, of course, many other quasi-experimental designs, but these are some of the most relevant ones that you can use as a basis for designing a true or quasi-experiment for your own research project. Remember, the key in any experiment is to maximize your internal and external validity. Be open and honest about the design of your experiment and the way in which you tried to achieve these goals. And be clear about the impact that not achieving them might have. Say, for example, you're not able to engage in random selection, but are instead reliant on those who are readily available to you. In education research, for example, you may need to work with your own students, as Jane Elliott did and as I often do. The key is recognizing the impact that this might have on external validity. Do your students share certain characteristics that might limit the ability to generalize from your results to other populations? If the answer is yes, it's fine. 
really. Don't attempt to overstate your claims. Your work still has plenty of value, and you or other researchers might try to replicate it with different subjects, which will further test the external validity of your claims. You don't have to do everything in a single study. You just have to be honest about what you have and have not achieved.